Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we're sitting down with a couple representatives from the Northern Marianas Protection and Advocacy Systems, Inc., also known as an imposse to most people. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Program Manager Greg Borja and Project Specialist Don Sablon. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Um, we want to talk specifically about one of your programs, Protection and Advocacy, advocacy if I can say it, uh, for individuals with mental health. What is this program all about? All right, well, thanks for asking. Um, in Imposse, we do administer eight programs here, and the Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness program is one of them. We call it PAMI for short. Um, basically, in 1986, this law was created um, as a result of the U.S. Congress finding that individuals that have mental illness are vulnerable to abuse and to serious injury. And additionally, individuals with mental illness are subject to neglect, which includes lack of treatment, adequate nutrition, clothing, health care, and adequate discharge planning. So the purpose of our program is to ensure that the rights of individuals with mental illness are protected. And basically, it was to help the CNMI establish and operate a protection and advocacy system uh, particularly for people with mental illness. And basically through that protection and advocacy, uh, we're gonna fight for the rights of the individual um, through activities that enforce the U.S. Constitution, our state and federal laws. So let's be clear and, and talk definitions. What is a mental illness and what is not a mental illness? Because a lot of times people get what they perceive wrong. We'll use the definition um, that we get from the Centers for Disease Control, <laughs> all right, the CDC. Um, and what they say in mental illness is, uh, mental illnesses are conditions that affect a person's thinking, feeling, mood, or behaviors. These conditions may be occasional or they could be long-lasting, what we call chronic. And they affect someone's ability to relate to others and to function each day. There are all types of different types of mental illnesses out there. Some of the common ones that you might be aware of are anxiety disorders, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, we have disruptive behavior disorders with kids a lot of times. Um, sometimes uh, depression is another one that, that we see here locally in the CNMI. We now, also, wh wait, oh, ahead, wh why do you say that? Why did you kind of pull that one out? The depression in yeah, the CNMI? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, just with the folks that we have work with, particularly, that's their underlying disability. You see depression. that a lot. We're seeing a lot. Yes. Yeah, so when you come in, when an individual comes to our office to seek services, they do need to bring proof of disability. And so a lot of times that's their diagnosis uh, is depression. Hmm. Um, and, as, uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about how depression is affecting folks during this COVID-19 experience. But a lot of times prior to this pandemic, maybe just uh, it, it comes in relation with like substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, also, which is very kind of prevalent here in the CNMI as well. And when people don't have access to those substances, they start feeling, uh, d you know, that those press sad feelings that don't go away. Um, we also see depression tied in with uh, bipolar disorder, all right, or manic depression as it's called. And so that's why I was saying that depression is, is kind of here a little bit more increased in the CNMI. We also see it with our youth, um, working with the Garrett Lee Smith um, program. They work with kids that uh, basically uh, are thinking of suicide and at times it's because they've been isolated or they have lack of friends and it just brings on this great depression and so the Garrett Lee Smith program basically works with with kids and students when they feel that way to try to you know give them different treatment um, not not always medication you know sometimes it's just counseling talking working with peers uh, peers are people that have lived experiences with different types of mental illness um, or they could be a recovering uh, substance abuse user or substance user and so just being able to talk it out with someone that's what those kind of programs are for to help people so with our youth and with some of our adults th that's depression <laughs> 
Okay, and then you, I'm sorry, I interrupted no, no, you no when problem. you were going through the list, but um, depression and, and what else um, are some other kinds of mental illnesses? Post, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm-hmm. um, we, we, see, we see that with some of our returning veterans. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, experience some trauma while they were deployed, and so they'll come back and might, they might be a little bit of a different person, so they just need to have treatment and help when it comes to that. And then again, um, our substance abuse, our substance use disorders, um, people using methamphetamines, alcohol use, uh, excessive alcohol use, binge drinking. Um, so there are programs on island that help with that. Um, another one, I don't know if it's so common in the CNMI, but we see it in the mainland. There's also various types of eating disorders. Those are also mental health um, disorders. And this could be either overeating, it could be not eating enough. It could be a poor self-image, you know, uh, body shape, weight, you know, so people, there, there's an eating disorder that's associated with that. Um, now, for the purposes of our program, I mean, what, what do you call it? Because you're asking also what uh, mental illness is not. Yeah. Um, they use what's called the, Diagno- the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Illnesses, DSM. Um, it's the fifth edition. So that's where psychiatrists, psychologists, they'll look at different diagnoses in terms of what a mental illness is. How our program works, though, when someone has a type of, uh, like, for example, going back to disruptive behavior disorder, while it is a type of mental illness, because it happens with youth uh, prior to the age of 22, and it sometimes leads to three functional limitations, like uh, difficulty in learning, maybe uh, self-care, self-direction, they consider that more of a developmental disability. Uh, Autism spectrum disorder is a similar one as well. While it is classified in the DSM-5 as a mental illness, the way that our grantors look at it, though, is that it's something that happens in the developmental stages of people, and so they consider it a developmental disability. That really is a, a long list of what could potentially be a mental illness. Let, can we talk just a little bit about some of the stigmas uh, in our community related to mental illness? Like people might want to say, oh, that person has, you know, this kind of mental illness or, or whatever. What kind of, and I, I, I just feel, I actually feel sorry for anybody who's really struggling, but maybe um, labeled. What's, what's going on in our community with that? So from my own experience, and I've been working here um, through with the PAMI program for 18 years, um, stigma, just to give you a definition of it, it's a mark of disgrace associated with particular circumstance, quality, or person. And so a lot of times stigma falls on people who have mental illness because they're perceived as uh, they act a little bit different, they behave you know, different around us. Um, things like schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders where people see or hear things that aren't there, they're just talking to themselves, although they're having a full conversation with someone in their mind. Um, we, we as people might see that as you know something different than what we typically believe in. Mm-hmm. Um, so that creates a stigma. Um, there's also perceived stigmas where people might have beliefs that um, folks with mental illnesses might be a danger to them uh, or to themselves. And then uh, some internalized stigma. Maybe it's just I had a bad experience with one person growing up, and you know now I think everybody that is that has a type of mental illness is going to act the same way. So again, that's where I'm getting putting those labels on people when it comes to stigma. Uh, what I see out here is some of the things that happen with stigma is that if I'm going to go seek help because I'm, I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling depressed. Maybe my family's not gonna want me to go and see the psychiatrist about it because I'm at the hospital, people might see me and say, oh man, there's Greg, he's in, you know, going into the psychiatric unit. And so it might be a mark of shame on my family, but it's really nothing to be ashamed of. When, when, you, when you need help, uh, you, know, you should ask for it. So a lot of times it might be either yourself not wanting to go in and get help, or it could be your family or friends trying to keep you away from it because of that labeling. Um, Because it doesn't just go to the individual, a lot of times it rolls back on the family and you know, we're a tight knit community. So uh, everyone kind of knows everyone um, and it's just something to be aware of. Myself, I grew up, I have an uncle with schizophrenia and I've I've never been afraid of him. Yeah, at times he might talk and say very strange things, but again, I just recognize, I understand that that's 
what he sees and hears in his mind and it's nothing to be afraid of and again I've grew up with the guy so I've, I've never been afraid of him but other people in the community maybe are not so comfortable being around individuals mm -hmm. it's it's just I think if you're human you need help at some point that's that's the way I look at it and um, whether it be like you said a psychiatrist or a, a religious leader or or a elder that you look up to who can help you kind of find your ground, your grounding. Um, I think we can all relate to needing somebody to give us guidance at some point. And maybe some of us just need more guidance than others, but we can all relate, I think. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up about um, our religious leaders, because those are an untapped uh, resource here in our community. And again, people feel very open when they speak to their priest or their pastor or what have you. So, I um, mean, again, I myself, I work with folks, uh, my peers, people that have the same experience as me because they know where I'm coming from. So again, it's just tapping into those, those resources is really beneficial to anyone involved uh, that needs mental health care. Now, you mentioned a little bit earlier about COVID-19. Um, I can imagine that some people, well, I, I mean, you don't have to imagine it. You, you see uh, people fearful. Not everybody's fearful, but some people are more fearful than others. How does a situation like this relate to mental illness? So uh, just over the past few months, Mental Health America did research on how many increase of anxiety and depression during the pandemic, right? And so they're, the most important thing that they went out telling people is that every concern is valid. So if you're, you know, you're scared to go out, you don't want, you don't want to wear your mask, or you, you're too scared to go to the hospital to get help, even if you are feeling sick, it's because of all of that fear, where and fear again comes with mental illness and mental health, right? You're trying to get help, but then at the same time you're fearful of again the stigma or getting labeled as oh she's crazy because she's getting help because it's just it's just a virus, right? Everyone at first was like. So it's nothing to be worried about. It's just something that the media's, you know, playing playing us with. But then now it's how many months into it, and everyone's building has built up all this fear and anxiety regarding the coronavirus. And actually, eighty eight thousand people have about eighty eight thousand people have increased ex labeled in depression and anxiety throughout self screening through Mental Health America. And a majority of those issues come from isolation and isolation and loneliness. So that was the biggest topic that they picked up on during this pandemic, when everybody was self-quarantining and avoiding people. Loneliness actually became one of the biggest issues that they found. They said that loneliness is more dangerous than smoking cigarettes and obesity. So that's one of the things that made me more aware about maybe I do need to reach out to other people even if it's just through messaging or something like that. Mm. You know another thing that I noticed in my life was um, with all of the protests that are happening in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement and of course it comes up on your YouTube feed so it's always there you click on and I realized I was I was getting kind of um, depression may be too strong but I was feeling down fortunately I recognized it and I was I was able to tell myself okay I'm gonna consciously not click on this so much Greg you were mentioning before the show trauma also can relate to your mental health and mental illness. Yes, what we've learned, what we've learned is, is that uh, there's a thing called vicarious trauma. Although the trauma is not happening for you yourself, but if you're observing it, um, either in real life or like you said on YouTube, you're seeing those those problems happening every day. It's gonna weigh on you after a while. Um, people that may not really realize it. But we see it a lot like with our folks that are in EMT, for example, that are always reporting to like car crashes, things like that. And seeing those kinds of things on a daily basis um, is might be hard for someone who's not trained like an EMT person is. You know, they get specific training in terms of how to, to see and work with those folks. But us, you know, again, maybe we don't know how to react correctly to those feelings we're having, seeing these things on the news in terms of the rioting, the looting. Because um, again, the, not just depression, but I, I get bouts of like anger I feel you know about what's going on in the world and there's just positive ways that, that we can try to deal with those behaviors or negative ways for those feelings that we have in ourselves so 
um, yeah, it's, it's all about self-care. So let me ask you a personal question. Um, do you, are you conscious, do you make conscious decisions about what you consume through your social media or your YouTube? I mean, being in this, in this uh, profession, do you like find yourself monitoring yourself um, or h- how does that work for you guys? You know, um, to be honest, as, as soon as I clock out, um, from work, I, I try to clock out from work all the way. Um, and if it's something that's that's kind of related to my work, I, I try to stay away from it while I'm at home because uh, mm-hmm. those kinds of things do bring me down. I don't personally, I don't watch a lot of the COVID nineteen stuff on the news. Um, you know, it's, it starts getting political or the media and stuff. I don't want to be part of all that. Um, I'm just about the facts and the figures. You know, how can I help myself, help my family? Um, and again, limiting yourself, uh, it, it can only be beneficial to you. Folks that, for example, again, work um, with victims, you won't see them like like people that like domestic violence, for example, people that work with victims of domestic violence aren't going to be tuning in to like law and order every night and seeing that recurring over and over. Because they day. live it in their work. Right. Yeah. They're doing it every day. And so you do need to kind of just turn off. I um, mean, it's, it's not a bad thing to, to you know, disconnect from electronics for a while. I think that's good for mental health. Yeah. Yeah, for me, self-awareness and how I become conscious about what I'm looking at. So I'm a project specialist, right? So I'm always, always trying to find new ways to do outreach, new ways to connect with my peers and everybody else regarding mental health and all of that. And one of the things I realized, especially the last few months, is that these things do take a toll on me. So I practice my, in my self-help toolbox one of the things is self-awareness i know when to turn off i know when to put my phone away or to shut everybody off and just you know take care of myself because that's the most important thing is to take care of yourself because you know when you're not able to get help immediately the only person there to help you out is yourself so that's the most important thing i take care of And that's a great segue, by the way. When we come back, I'm going to ask you if you guys could share some suggestions on how we can individually help uh, maintain good health. How's that sound? Sounds perfect. All right. We'll be back after this break. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact our daily lives, including our cultural institutions and individuals who contribute to the humanities. The Northern Marianas Humanities Council is pleased to announce a new grant program uh, so who's to respond answer to the first needs of nonprofit organizations skills, and individual participants pointers. in the okay. humanities who need support through this difficult time. Okay. The COVID-19 relief uh, grant provides right. up to fifteen thousand dollars to eligible organizations and up to ten thousand dollars to eligible individuals. Visit the Northern Marianas Humanities Council website at www. Dot nmhcouncil.org forward slash COVID-19 to learn more about this opportunity for relief. The Northern Marianas Humanities Council COVID-19 relief grants are made possible by funding from the U.S. Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We are speaking with Greg Borja, Program Manager, and Don Sablon, Project Specialist of NM Posse, about protection and advocacy for individuals with mental illness. Don, can you give us some uh, practical ways that every individual can help uh, maintain better mental health? So the most important thing we, as professionals, is to seek professional help. But again, at t- times like this, or even behind stigma, right? We're not able to, we're not, maybe we're too fearful to go get professional help. So some of the things I've learned in my time here at Imposse is to find self-help or self-coping skills to help ease, to help get through the day, I guess, I like to say it, to get help get through your day. So one of the, so during Mental Health, Amer- Mental Health Awareness Month last month, or May, right? Yeah, last month they focused on tools to thrive or ways that we can tools we can pack in our toolbox for us to help get through get through those tough times i like that because everyone needs a toolbox yeah go ahead (laughs) so one of the things that the most important thing that they said is to own your feelings so to accept that okay i am going through something right now and i need help so you either cry it out or you talk about it talk to someone about it scream get mad just something that 
to get those feelings out, to validate your feelings that I am going through something, this is this is real, this is happening. And for other people to accept that. Like, okay, I understand you're going through something. Let's talk about it or let's let's write it down. So we can at least see that okay, these emotions and feelings are real and that they're not just something I made up. So there is a lot of resources here on island. There's the community guidance center, there's the hospital, the psychiatrist at the hospital. And there's also online help where you can just reach a friend if you're not able to, if you're not, if you're too fearful to reach professional help, right? And then another tool they focused on is finding positives. It doesn't mean always smiling or trying to be so happy with everything, right? It's But it's practicing self-gratitude. Okay, I, even though I'm going through this, at least I'm, I have this. Right. At least I could get out yeah. of bed this morning yeah. and walk on my own two yeah. feet. Yeah, it's hard. It's it's hard to focus on that, but at the same time, it's something that we need to consciously take in every day. Attitude of gratitude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. And then there's also connecting with others. So that's especially during the pandemic, right? It's hard to go out and socialize the way we used to here in here in the islands. We're always out, always connecting with others, always socializing but then when the pandemic hit and we were forced to not do any of those things it became harder and we saw that with the increase of um, mental health needs but connecting with others is one of the things that you can do just with your phone just by yourself with your phone right you can message somebody and say hey how are you doing you don't even need to mention any of the trauma that you've experienced just talking to somebody about regular everyday things will help and then you can also eliminate toxic influences. So you know we have those certain family members or certain people or certain like social media, for example, where there's constant negative things that's happening. We can limit the contact with that or completely get rid of it altogether. So for me, there's I always delete a lot of things from my social media feed. I don't want to see this, delete. I don't want to deal with anything, I'm going to delete it. Like those constant emails you get, right, regarding updates and updates and updates. I said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to see any of that. So I delete it. It's called mute notification. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there's also creating healthy routines. That's um, during the pandemic, we, we needed to change everything up, right? So from, from the way we get up to go to work, instead of going to work, physically going to work, we had to stay home. So one of those things is to create new routines and on average it takes about 66 days and I think we're just about there. <laughs> so those new routines, we just need to continue practicing. So, and then also add in buffers where if something, so when you're creating a routine, add a buffer where just in case this doesn't happen, just in case there's something, another emergency that happens, your routine won't be completely thrown off like it did with the corona. All good advice there. And um, I want to ask, it's, this may be kind of a broad question. I almost feel like we could do a whole nother show on this. But let's look now from the perspective of uh, people around the person who, who may have a mental illness or who does have a mental illness. Can you give us the highlights of what family members, friends, colleagues, employers should be aware of related to mental illness? Uh, what you want to do, I guess, as a family member, because um, me, I have my own kids, they're in the mainland, some of them, and, you know, they call me, kind of like Don's saying, uh, they're reaching out, and so they contact me quite often, and it's just being supportive of their needs. Um, sometimes it's just good to, to just be there to listen, um, you know, don't don't compare what you're experiencing here on Saipan to what's happening on Guam or something like that, just give them the opportunity to talk. Because a lot of times that's basically what they need is they just want to let it out or vent, you know, um, just so that they can feel some kind of support or help uh, as a family member. You know, that's my biggest thing is, is is just trying to create that support system for them. And if I don't have all the answers, I'll try to connect them to other resources. Um, I really like what Don says, you know, reaching out to your peers and just getting folks together. Like my son here, I mean, he's not having a problem with any of this isolation at all. He lives on a computer, so he's, he doesn't seem to be bothered by it. Um, but again, other people around that aren't used to being isolated, you know, uh, that's where you just want to go out and, and just 
give give them an ear. You know, that's the great way to connect with them is basically give them the opportunity to talk about what they're going through and then just offer any suggestions or options. You know, don't tell them you specifically have to do this. Just give them a list of things. Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Mm. Um, like Donna was saying also about like the healthy routines, you know, that's something you can set up with your whole family. I noticed in myself, for example, um, an increase in substance use at the initial stages of, of when we were being isolated in this forced quarantine. And so those are not healthy choices, all right? And so I had to reach out and talk to other folks that were basically trying to stray away from diving into too much alcohol and whatnot. And so that kind of support system is beneficial to, to everyone, you know? Um, and so that's what I would offer as suggestions to family members is, you know, talk it out with, with your family member. Um, you yourself, if you're not aware of what type of, you know, what the symptoms or what the, the background is of a specific mental illness, do some research on your own. Jump on Google. Mental Health America, again, is a great website uh, where they can offer all types of tools. Like you said, the toolbox, everyone needs one. So they have a whole downloadable toolkit, it's a PDF file. And they have a great wealth of information in there. Uh, you can also reach out to other, you can always contact our office, but there, there's a lot of different resources. Mental Health America is one that we like because they do a lot when it comes to awareness. Uh, the Center for D Disease Control, again, statistics and data driven, but again, they offer a lot of great awareness on their website, especially about specific types of mental illness. So as a family member, get to know you know, what your family member is going through, because maybe that's the first step is getting that understanding for yourself will also help them. Mm. Um, I think it would be responsible for us um, before I give you time for closing thoughts to just um, highlight when a person or what a person might experience when they know, like, I really need to uh, seek professional help at this point and not try to solve this problem on our own, on my own. Can you give us a few points on that? Basically, one, one of the things I can offer in terms of um, some options is if you've tried all the self-care that you can, if you tried talking to family members and you're just still not feeling well, that, that's where you do want to reach out to for professional help. Um, and again, I have specific people that I know um, at the Community Guidance Center, for example, because again, they're my peers, they've been through the similar experience I have, and it's easy for me to talk to them. And so that's one way, uh, I guess, just trying to reach out to the psychiatric unit or do a walk-in at the family care clinic to meet with one of our psychiatrists here on island. Um, and again, just don't don't be ashamed to go in there and seek that help. You know, keep your head up when you're going in there asking for help because it's, it's only going to be, it's just going to make your life a little easier. And it'll if you have your family with you, maybe your family will be a little bit more understanding what you're going through. Um, Don, you have some additional on? Yeah. So CGC is part of CHC, right? But they have um, the wellness clinic for adults who need adult counseling, especially if they experience trauma. Their numbers can be reached at 323-6560 or 61. And then for youth, you can contact Systems of Care or the Garrett Lee Smith. For Garrett Lee Smith, it's 664-LIFE or LIVE or 5433-5483. And again, if you're experiencing an immediate emergency and you feel unsafe for yourself or unsafe for others around you, you can call 911 and go to the emergency room and they can get you the immediate help you need. Well, I want to thank you both for making time to talk about this important topic today and also for the work you do. Obviously, this is a very important work for our community. So thank you. Any final thoughts before we go? <laughs> well, I'll just, uh, I guess, throw it in some information a little bit about our office. Um, if you are, because this is one I heard just recently from some of the folks who are like in quarantine, for example. Um, you have to go there from 7 to 14 days, you know, and again, you do have mental health professional or maybe not mental health professionals on site, but you have health professionals. But again, uh, they're there to treat you for your symptoms of COVID. They're not there to treat you for the sadness you might be feeling or that loneliness you might be feeling because you're stuck in a room and can't go and talk to anybody, no physical contact with folks. So if you need mental health care in those areas and you're experiencing a barrier, you know, get a hold of our office, uh, 235 or 7274, and we can help 
you know, try to eliminate those barriers that, that, that you might be experiencing. We also have our folks, our frontline folks, um, you know, who helps the helpers, you know, so we want to make sure that there's support out there for them. I think we're very fortunate on island. Uh, we just got a, a second psychiatrist. And again, it's, that's got to be a difficult job for one person to to do on their own, you know, because they're treating what the thousands of, of people and then, you know, you don't get a day off. But now you have a support system of your own. So I'm very grateful for the hospital for bringing in an additional psychiatrist. And again, because uh, again, help for the helpers. <laughs> it's a it's a great one. Well, we've been chatting today with Program Manager Greg Borja and Project Specialist Don Sablon of NM Posse regarding protection and advocacy for individuals with mental health, a mental illness. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. You can contact us on Facebook at 670 Humanities. And if you'd like to hear more of our show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at Northern Marianas Humanities Council. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.